Hello. Uh, my name is Maya Smrikar. I am an uh, intermediate artist uh, uh, coming from uh, Slovenia, uh, Ljubljana. I have to say, first of all, that uh, this stage is really too much for me. It's really too much for me. I feel overexposed, so I'm going to sit there and do my presentation from there. I think that you probably all uh, a little bit agree with me, this stage. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so, um, thank you for your understanding. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm an intermedia artist. I have uh, uh, finished um, an academy for fine art uh, and design in Ljubljana. Uh, at the department of uh, uh, sculpture. Then I have uh, uh, also finished uh, my master's uh, degree at uh, the same academy uh, at the field of uh, new media. Um, I am um, connecting the intersections of uh, uh, humanistic and natural sciences uh, into interdisciplinary projects. Um, and uh, usually it starts like this, it starts very blunt and uh, it starts uh, 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 very um, autopoetic uh, uh, and very naive uh, when I start, uh, 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 when I um, decide myself uh, which phenomenology I'm interested in, but then uh, uh, I usually, uh, after I get, um, the fundings, uh, and if I get them, but usually I do. Um, I uh, then uh, usually uh, compose together the plethora of uh, um, different uh, uh, professionals uh, uh, at the different fields, uh, and uh, um, then it takes quite a lot of time uh, uh, of... Um, sometimes very hard, but uh, always very um, inspirational uh, uh, dialogues uh, uh, from which I learn really a lot and which inspire me actually to uh, make my concepts, uh, artistic concepts, as rich as possible. Uh, so I have been until... Um, let me just mention some of the institutes I've been collaborating with. Um, uh, University in Ljubljana, Department of uh, Anthropology and Cultural Ethnology, uh, Biotechnical uh, Faculty, Department of uh, Biotechnology and Department of uh, Forestry and Re Renewable Resources, um, Institute of uh, Biochemistry at the Medical Faculty of the um, University of Ljubljana. I have also been uh, collaborating with um, um, University of um, um, uh, Electrical Engineering uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know how is it called Electrical Engineering and well, that science that uh, does have to do a lot with uh, machines and cars. So uh, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, <laughs> hardware and software. <laughs> developers. So, yeah, um, at the moment I am interested in my work uh, in two, I'm actually doing, uh, uh, executing series of um, uh, exhibitions on two big topics and uh, one is um, uh, the um, uh, uh, invasive species and the sixth big species extinction uh, and crash, uh, crash of, uh, uh, crashes of ecosystems, which is actually uh, happening uh, 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 all over the world. It's been happening since the Industrial Revolution uh, and uh, ever since it's actually, uh, it's been increasing very, very fast. And uh, for the last uh, 30 years, it's actually really alarming. Uh, but it's actually kind of coming like, uh, um, I see it as the um, quite a big uh, uh, crisis, uh, uh, which is also connected, on the other hand, uh, with with the um, the biggest 
invasive species uh, on this planet, which is uh, humans, of course. Uh, uh, I think that a very huge crisis is coming uh, uh, considering uh, different resources that we are very used to, and especially food. Uh, and I'm also very much interested on ethical issues considering um, uh, this will maybe sound very, uh, but it shouldn't, um, uh, um, a population regulation because I think, I personally think that the most uh, uh, ecological decision and responsible decision for this per, uh, planet at this moment is not to have children. Uh, I mean, your biological children, of course. But, um, okay, <laughs> I'm being censored. <laughs> but uh, um, on the other hand, it is very hard how to, um, uh, how to uh, overlass, uh, overlap and transcend it, uh, transcendent uh, uh, hundreds of years of uh, um, um, uh, emotional e economy that actually uh, composed in ourselves uh, in the times of evolution. So actually, for the end, I am basically interested in the concept of life. Thank you. So hello from my side to everybody. Um, I'm Nadine Zena, I'm 24 years old, and I'm now, in, now doing my master's graduation. Uh, in combination with the two years project for Daimler Smart in the innovation management. I want to tell you from my academical way because this is not the real topical way of studying. I got the chance to make a dual system in the bachelor, so this means that in three and a half years I made my bachelor and I got an apprenticeship in mechatronics, so I got the perfect combination out of practical work and the academical background. Um, this was the apprenticeship was made by Miele, where I also got the chance to do some projects directly linked to my study uh, in production technology. After my bachelor graduation, I now started the Master of Business Engineering with um, yeah, specialization in general management, which is doing together between the Steinbeis um, University Berlin and SMART. And so now I have the chance to be for two years working for SMART and um, yeah, to be in the innovation management there. I want to tell you something about the tasks um, which I'm doing there. The first thing and maybe the most important thing is about the definition and the implementation of an innovation process. So how do we come to the innovations we will need in the future? This is the main question we are asking ourselves. And uh, then we look to different steps we have to do. Of course, one big step of it is the idea management. Um, where we have to look how to get ideas, how many people do we have to involve, how can we handle a mass of ideas, and how we can find the right idea, of course. So uh, we use a lot of committee management for the controlling, which is maybe not the most interesting stuff you can do, but it's really necessary. And uh, next to this, you need to work for an innovative culture, which means that you can't do such committees like sitting together and you have a clear structure. Sometimes you just have to come together in a workshop style or something like this and everybody is allowed to say whatever he wants to say and nobody is allowed to say, no, I don't think that will work because otherwise you will break the flow of ID management. If you've got good ideas, then it comes to a concept development and we try to bring the ideas into the car. Now I shortly want to tell you how this all is connected to what we are doing here and of course to the post city. Uh, I call it the trend-driven innovation cycle. Um, you can start from every point in the cycle, but I want to start by the trends. So if you see a trend like, for example, the development of the city with connected topics, with networking, with 
lightning, things, all the things we have seen today, very inspiring things that show us a trend and a direction. This always tells us about, from the business position, about how our future customer will look. And of course, we want to serve the needs of our future customer. And therefore, we generate innovation that are meeting their needs. So what will help the future customer to can live better in the way of smart in a city because it's a city car. And what happens then is very interesting because the innovations we make, they by themselves, they affect in which way the customer is able to live. If you've got new possibilities to live, your life will change. For example, this mass of individual mobility like we see it today would never be possible without the invention of the car. So the innovation by itself changed the customer lives and you will get new trends if many innovations come together and the customer will make a new lifestyle out of it. And so the cycle is closed again. And now I'm really interested to see um, what trends we will see together and how your view is. So this means that I can take this for myself and I can really get some new opinions. So thank you very much. Hello, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Kimitaro Hattori. Uh, please call me Kimi. Uh, I come from Japan. Um, but uh, I cannot speak uh, English well, but I will try somehow. Um, I am a graphic designer from an advertising agency. And at the same time, I work on contemporary art and fine art in my free time. Uh, what I always care in creative works is changing fixed ideas. For example, this is my old works uh, called A Picture of an Apple. Uh, this is uh, by adding simple two lines to Japanese national flags. Uh, the strong message of national flag is made zero. Using uh, real national flag and uh, just simple two lines. And next, this is another simple object that I colored the holes in golf balls. Very simple use of the golf ball. Uh, next. Uh, this is, how to say, a mount, uh, standard. Uh, this, I just tipped the mount at the museum and uh, placed, uh, placed a very small ski player doll on the top of the mount and give the name. Uh, this is the name, is uh, mount as a ski slope. This is my style. And in this uh, piece, I try to give different meanings to things by using uniqueness of the object and the image made, by, made up by people. At Future Innovators Summit, I'd like to use this approach of changing fixed ideas to search for post kit ideas. Uh, four minutes is too long to me, just uh, enough. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Pamela from Manila, the Philippines. Um, took me 23 hours to travel from my house to Linz. Um, very glad to be here, finally. Um, it's nice to not be in an airport for once. Um, so, like many of you, I wear many hats. Uh, I'm a social activist. I'm part of two NGOs, one on maternal and reproductive health and another on human rights and women's education. I teach uh, community development in university. Uh, but my main thing is I'm a design anthropologist and I run my own research consultancy called Curiosity Design Research. Um, we do a lot of research on different fields from anti-art forgery to fishing to agriculture and financial literacy. But as a company, we have special interest in disaster and resilience. Um, it's not just a company interest, it's also a personal interest as well. Um, I'm 36 years old and in my lifetime, I have lived through an earthquake, a volcanic eruption, 
um, countless of typhoons. And in 2009, there was a typhoon that brought an unprecedented rainfall to Manila, and 90% of the city was submerged in water in floods knee-deep up to two stories high. And we basically, there was a strong sense of civic participation, and we rescued each other through social media. Um, but the thing that really deepened our interest in disaster was our experience in shelter reconstruction um, after Typhoon Yolanda, or Typhoon Haiyan, as you might know it. I'm sure you've seen many images of it on, um, on television. And we were there um, on Ground Zero in Tacloban City one week after the disaster happened. Um, it brought tremendous damage, four million homes damaged, uh, one million homes damaged, four million people displaced, 10,000 people dead. Um, and one of our key projects here through one of the NGOs that I work with on uh, women's rights and education um, is better, building better homes, uh, training for women homeowners. 70% of the casualties of Typhoon Haiyan were women and children. But when we were doing our research in coastal communities, we found out that there were communities who decided to send their women and children to evacuation centers, and the men stayed behind to guard their homes. Um, the media kept warning people about the storm surge. There was so much information about it. Um, the Weather Bureau talked about it. The news agencies talked about it. But still, um, the men in these communities and a lot of other people were washed away by the storm surge because nobody knew what a storm surge was. So there was a lot of information without understanding. And we're trying to help women become more resilient by in this training, we talk to them about climate change using layman's terms. We talk to them about the disaster response structure in the country. And we teach them that you know, rebuilding your homes is not just a man's job. Women have to participate in it as well because there are a lot of widows left by the typhoon. And they are faced with the challenge to build their own homes without any knowledge of construction. Um, another key project after Typhoon Haiyan was building um, what they said is the first uh, structure purposely built as an evacuation center in central Visayas. A lot of local governments take a shortcut approach to evacuation. What they basically do is they take a big space like a coliseum or a school and lead the people there. But what happens after the disaster is Donated clothes come, there are no places to wash them, there are not enough toilets, there are a lot of food as relief goods, but there are no kitchens to cook them in. So this evacuation center that we built with the people, they had input on the actual design, um, addresses all those problems. And we decided to inaugurate it, um, even if it wasn't finished, we intended two floors, but this is just the first floor. And one month after we inaugurated it, another typhoon came, um, and it saved around 30 families from a nearby island. Um, and one of the other things that we do in relation to cities is we helped organize the Manila Urban Design Festival and Design Week. Um, the idea of urban design is so new um, to the public in Metro Manila, so we decided that we needed to create both online and offline spaces to just get people interested in the idea of urban design, and we invited everyone from uh, scientists to urban planners, architects, um, even artists that deal with uh, the urban space um, to open up the conversation. Um, so if there's anything that I took out of going through this exercise and relating my work to cities is, you know, we talk about the idea of post-city, but maybe we should also talk about the idea of post-cities because even in just one country and between two cities, Manila and Tacloban City, the experience is so different. And if we were to build a post-city kit, then an ideal kit for me would be one that would account for human difference, for differences in vulnerability, and differences in access to technology. There are a lot of notions about technology that we need to unsettle. Like, for example, a smartphone comes with internet. That's not necessarily the case in developing countries. There are a lot of people in the Philippines who own smartphones but can't afford to pay for internet, and that you know, gives rise to a lot of technological practices that we need to understand. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Diego. I'm an artist. Um, I wasn't always an artist. I started off as a scientist and then really didn't like that. Changed my mind halfway. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about my work. Uh, this is a piece I built recently. I got awarded um, a honorable mention in hybrid art this year at this festival. And uh, it's a piece about 
surveillance technology. So it was inspired by news articles about uh, Snowden's NSA leaks. And I was thinking that uh, sort of the narrative in those news articles is very similar to Cold War spy fiction like James Bond and MacGyver. So I set off to design a machine that prints out self-destructing messages and sets them on fire like in the movies. Um, and then, yeah, the things that are printed there are a combination between uh, real extracts from NSA documents and, um, yeah, film stills from Cold War fiction. And then in my work, I try to approach technology not only as a medium, but also as the embodiment of human culture and desires. And just, I think that the way that we build and use technology says a lot, lot about uh, human nature in general. And then I was asked to, to connect my work uh, to the post city. And actually, I really struggled with that. So I'm going to talk about some projects that have to do with sort of living space that I worked on before. Um, this is a project called With Robots that I did in 2011. And I was thinking about what it means to have domestic robots. What, what does it mean to have a machine in your house that does everything for you? Especially when you have like the first generation of these machines. So what I did was that I retrofitted a lot of my household items so that they would be robot friendly. And I didn't set out to design a robot and think about all the technicalities of how it would handle a teacup. I just thought, you know, it can't grab that handle and it's a new one. Uh, it can't read my furniture. It needs little tags all around the place. And then I actually lived like that for like a month in my flat. And with this image, I was uh, more interested in sort of the atmospheres of this imaginary home. So what, how would I feel if I walked into my house every day and the meat had been chopped up with like robotic precision and all the meat packaging was robot friendly and I couldn't understand any of it. And I had to live in this sort of environment designed for technology and not for myself. Um, and then that is to the, the most uh, urban related piece of work I've done so far. Uh, so this is, I was teaching a workshop at the Architectural Association in London in July. And the brief we said the, the students was that we wanted them to consider uh, infrastructure as a paranormal force because we saw a lot of overlap between the way we experience the occult and the paranormal and the way we experience uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure is basically invisible. You don't interact with it. It's designed to be in the background, but yet it's guiding your life in very sort of prescriptive manners. You know, there's CCTV cameras all over the place in London. There's uh, car plate cameras. The tube runs at certain times. Uh, so we felt that this was sort of like being under the effects of voodoo or hypnotism. And we asked students to make uh, little Arduino circuits that sort of explore that. So getting people to use electronic in more poetic ma manners rather than just problem solving skills. And that's pretty much everything I have to say. Thank you. So hi, my name is Stefan. I'm a seismologist and photographer. I'm living in Vienna, Austria. And as a researcher, I'm interested in any kind of mass movements like landslides, rock falls or glaciers. So on this photo, you can see me setting up a seismic station on a rockfall site. So we are monitoring the ground vibrations on these mass movements to get to know what's going on inside, how the mass moves, and how it will develop. Another example of my fieldwork is here the installation of a monitoring network on a glacier in um, Greenland, where we are observing the um, glacier lake outburst flood, which is happening yearly at this site. As a photographer and also as a skateboarder, I'm exploring the city and the interaction between architecture and skateboarding, which mainly means like using public space or reclaiming space and how this interacts with the city development. And most of my work is somehow connected to these keywords. So my recent project that I'm working on is this open hardware seismic data locker or any kind of data locker depending on the sensor you connect to it. So I'd like to use this to set up some kind of, or let's say at the end it should be a citizen science project, but I think, I think the way to this um, final solution is quite long. And 
like the question how I fit into this topic of post city is when I thought about this topic as an earth scientist, um, what first comes to my mind is the like are the, the large scale hazards. So the most prominent is the earthquake hazard. On the map you see the earthquakes um, with a magnitude larger than five, which means there's a pot potential danger to infrastructure. So these are all the earthquakes since 1980. And the red squares are the um, urban areas with a population of more than three million people. And you can immediately see a lot of these places are lying directly on these potential earthquake sites. And for me, this map is some kind of metaphor to all the challenges that we will have to face, which we can't control, but where we can only be well prepared and react and not act or do anything against it. We have just have to live with it. And that, I think, is my contribution to the ongoing discussion. Thank you.